Hello, everyone. Welcome to Stepping In Broadway Replacements. Yes, we are thrilled to be chatting with these incredible stars about the ins and outs of, repl of replacing a role in a production. Being a Broadway replacement can be daunting, so we're really interested to learn about their unique experiences. Now, before we get started, let's just have some inter introductions. My name is Dylan McDowell. And I'm Connor McDowell, and we're twin brothers who host a theater and pop culture podcast called Drama, where we talk about entertainment, love, and life in New York City and beyond. Today, we are joined by Carly Post, known for her work in the Bartlett Scherer tour of Fiddler on the Roof as Bielka. How are you today, Carly? Good. How are you? So good. We're also joined by Andrew Barth Feldman, who's a Jimmy Award winner who starred in Dear Evan Hansen as Evan himself. Hey, Andrew. Hey, guys. To begin, we're obviously going to hear from both Carly and Andrew. But to start, I would love to hear the story about how each of you got the role that you are best known for replacing and just the um, the story of how that audition went and what role that is. Yeah, maybe let's start with Carly. Ladies first. Oh, thank you. So polite. Um, so I had seen an open call on playbill.com. I was a sophomore in college at the time and said, yeah, why not? My finals are done. I'll go. And they were having um, appointments, actually. So I got an appointment, which was really nice. And I went in and did my 16 bar cut of my own song and thought nothing of it and was very intimidated, but thought it went okay and then left. And then the very next day I got a callback, which was pretty crazy. Um, and then it was right before Memorial Day. So there was that five days off because it was on a Thursday. So I waited out for Memorial Day weekend and then had my final callback pretty much right after that for the entire creative team and Bartlett Chair himself and everybody there and got an offer two days later and started the journey to Onatefka. What a quick turnaround. It was very quick, yeah. The current tour was already happening um, and I joined for the second year of the tour along with 23 new cast members, but they had a pretty quick turnaround. So they really had to get the casting done quickly. Wow, that's incredible. All right, Andrew, tell us about the journey to Evan. Yeah, mine's a little funky. Um, I did the Jimmy Awards, um, which are the National High School Musical Theater Awards. And if you don't know what that is, you should look it up and you're gonna be so happy. Um, but I uh, did that and, and Tara Rubin, who's the casting director of Dear Evan Hansen, was a judge. And um, Stacey Mindich, who's the producer, was in the audience because Dear Evan Hansen was sponsoring. So it was just all these things coming together. Um, and the uh, legend has it, and that's, this is what Stacey Mindich tells, and I have no reason to believe this isn't true, that she texted Tara Rubin at intermission after I had sung uh, my piece of in the medley uh, where I sang my Frank Jr. part. And she said, he needs to come into the room. That's our next Evan. Um, and so then I did win the awards and, and uh, I got an email a few days later uh, asking me to come in for actually the, um, the, the cover for Evan, Jared and Connor, um, which we speculate was just so that they, because they didn't want to scare me. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, it was, I go in and it was in front immediately. This was my first audition in front of Michael Greif and Ben Pasek and Justin Paul and Stephen Levinson, Alex Lacamoire, Stacey Mindich, basically all my heroes. And uh, I did the the Evan material and Michael Greif said, we're going to move on to the Jared material, but I want you to know that we're really going to cherish the Evan work that you've just done for us. <laughs> um, I did one Jared scene and then I left. Tara Rubin came out of the room and took a picture of me and said, you're gonna wanna remember this. Um, and then uh, I think it was just two or three days later that my mom got a call that, that I was going to be replacing Taylor in the show. That's incredible. And so the Jimmy Awards happened over the summer, right? Yes. And yes. so then, but you didn't join until that winter? I, the Jimmy Awards were in June. So I was cast in, I think, July, and then I joined in January. Wow. And it wasn't announced until November. And I had to keep, I had signed all the NDAs and stuff, and I really, nobody knew in my life. It was incredibly stressful. Mm. That's so interesting. We have two people on each side of that. I mean, Carly immediately went into everything and- yeah. You had that delayed gratification. How, I'm how special! Person in the world. It was awful. It was <laughs> terrible. It was a terrible few months. Now, Carly, you said that you joined a cast with twenty-three new cast members. So, was it was everyone in rehearsal together 
preparing for this second leg of the tour? Yeah, kind of. So as I said, they were currently touring when we had our New York rehearsals. So the people that were staying were the big ones, our Tevya and our Golda, Yenta, Seidel and Hoddle were all staying. So they were currently touring. So we learned the entire show without any of them, which if you've seen Fiddler on the Roof, doing it without a Tevya is really it's something. It's quite a challenge. Uh, but we all kind of worked together really quickly. And then we shadowed the current cast. They flew us all down to Dallas, which is where the current, the previous cast was closing. And we shadowed them for about a week, a little bit less. We had our one text slash dress rehearsal the afternoon of our opening night. And then we opened. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's wild. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually really curious about how you enter a show that's already running. Um, how do you even prepare for that? It's tough, um, especially with with me. You know, it's I was obsessed with the show, so so there was a lot of a, a lot of times replacements will trail, um, which basically means that um, like while Taylor was on stage, I would be literally in the wings, just clocking all his entrances and exits and following him around uh, when he was off stage. I never actually did that because I saw the show about probably 10 times after I was cast and just watching Taylor and Michael uh, play the part. And then I was like, I have to stop. I've stopped because I don't want to get anything stuck in my head. I want to do this myself. Um, and I had seen it enough times by that point that I was pretty much just off book anyway. So I, um, then I was in rehearsal and usually rehearsing first with nobody. First it would just be the associate directors and they would read with me or come on stage, like on stage, like, you know, uh, I, one of our, associate directors Danny would play Heidi like you know it was just whatever just to get through it then understudies and then uh eventually with with the full cast for put-ins and things like that but I mean I I really I didn't get to do the full show with the rest of the cast in costumes until I was doing it on Broadway um you know I in, put in put-ins it's kind of like an embarrassing ritual because whoever's being put in is wearing their costume and Michael Park is there in a t-shirt looking absolutely jacked and <laughs> It was, you know, it was, it was that kind of, um, it was terrifying, but uh, and especially with the rake stage and, and which basically means it's on an angle and, and the crazy projections, you know, doing that for the first time days before I was going to start was horrifying. Wow. But they, but they really, I mean, in, in we were at Chelsea Studios and literally the whole set was recreated in there basically with the, there was a bed and like the, 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 a secondary bed that they would take that, like they rented out the studio, I think for weeks. So the whole set was in there. So I had everything I needed to, to learn everything. That's awesome. Yeah, they, they really wanted to make sure that if I screwed up, it wasn't their fault. So <laughs> they did everything they could to, to, to make, make the experience as easy for me as possible. So yeah, what does that first full cast rehearsal feel like? Carly, you mentioned it was the actual day of your opening night. Yeah, I mean, it was just so crazy. I mean, Fiddler on the Roof is such a classic show and this version, Bart's version, the staging is just so beautiful. It, You hear the opening, for me, hearing just the opening violin in tradition, like, got me. And it was just really just a feeling like no other. And getting, we got really close as a cast really quickly. I think when you're thrown into that situation of, okay, we have two weeks basically to put this show up and then go in with 23 new people. Um, just, yeah, really just such a special experience. And my older sisters in the show really did become like my big sisters in real life. We still talk all the time and just such a special experience getting to be in the presence of Bartlett Cher is crazy dream. He's one of my role models in life. He does such beautiful shows and just so special. Carly, you should have done like a YouTube web series called 23 and Me about you and the 23 new cast members. Because this is 23 and Me. Why didn't this happen? Oh my gosh. Missed opportunity yeah. there, truly. Oh my God. Well, you know, I love that you mentioned that opening moment of Fiddler on the Roof, the iconic starting notes. You know, I think as an audience member, I can't help but get chills when that happens. And similar, similarly, in Dear Evan Hansen, it's like, when Waving Through a Window starts, even if you haven't seen the show before, it's one of those songs that just gets right into your soul, you know, like you feel it immediately. I'm, I, as an audience member, you feel it. And it's cool to hear you say that you feel it on stage. 
Andrew, would you say that there's any moments when you were in Dear Evan Hansen when you were like, oh my God, I, I feel so moved by this piece. Like, was there one moment every night that you felt that way? Yeah, at least one every night. And, and that was what was kind of so special about doing that show every day was that there was so much that really had to be consistent because, because Michael is a very, you know, precise director and that's what has led him to create all these Pulitzer Prize winning fantastic uh, shows. Um, he's a legend, of course, and he's incredible and he was amazing to work with, but he's really, really precise. Um, that's, but the thing with me is I really can't, I guess I can now kind of, but I couldn't cry on command. I really couldn't do it. So it, I had to be moved to do it. And I kind of, there were, I, I'd say eight points in the show that I'd cry for four of. Like, and they would kind of switch every night just because I'd find myself moved by a different thing. I think one of the things that's that's interesting that's now kind of part of the fabric of the show, or at least was when I was in it, was um, I started crying during Disappear. And no, Evan had ever done that before, and I hadn't had the intention of doing that, but hearing, you know, no one deserves to be forgotten, you know, all, all the, those gorgeous words that Connor is saying and like the, just thinking about the weight of the story up until that point, I, I just started crying. And it's funny, uh, Ivan Hernandez, who was another replacement in the show, he replaced for Larry a couple months after that. So it was after I had started doing that, after I'd been in the show for six months already. Um, somebody was talking about how now the understudies were being expected to cry during Disappear, that you know that was becoming a bit more of an emotional moment. And Ivan said, well, the show doesn't make sense if that doesn't happen. You know, it's so Ooh. kind of this, this thing where at least for, for my show didn't make sense if that didn't happen, you know, for, for Ben or for Taylor or now, you know, Jordan or, or Noah, their show could make sense with that. But with me, I, I needed that moment to propel me into the rest of the show. So I really did get to make so much of it my own. Wow. Carly, I'm curious, other than the opening moments of Fiddler, was there anything that always would give you goosebumps or, or make you feel like a pinch me type situation? Oh yeah. I mean, so many times and it really did change nightly, but um, the pogrom scene is, of course, the climax of the show. One of the climaxes of the show. It's the end of Act One. It's in the wedding scene. Spoiler, there's a wedding and a pogrom. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't seen Fiddler on the Roof. But, um, you know, we're, we're dancing in the circle and then we hear the crash and the way that it's staged, the constable comes on and flips the table and throws the plates and they're throwing feathers everywhere. And it's a really intense moment that for different reasons, we kind of use that as our release from the day because we're all huddled in a circle and we're crying. All the sisters are holding each other and it's just a very powerful moment. Um, but sweeter moments that kind of get me are just the moments with my sisters, the way that in Sunrise Sunset, we call it the pretzel hands. We're all kind of intertwined the way that we're all holding on to each other and what I call the Von Trapp line where we're, you know, down the line, the sisters uh, in the pretzel hands. And it's just that moment of connection as we're watching Seidel get married. And it's just one, a really special moment for me. I love it. You both mentioned, I mean, both of you were in productions helmed by legendary directors and creative teams in general. How much as a replacement would you actually get to interact with the original creative team? all the time uh, for, for me. I'm, you know, Michael, when I was um, just starting out in the show, Michael was actually doing Rent Live. So he was away uh, and he, he didn't get to really be there until around my put-ins. Uh, but once I was in the show, he was there all the time, especially uh, around the, uh, right, right before we had the Times Review, uh, which I did not know was going to happen. Uh, we had rehearsal almost every day um, just to to make sure we were as spiffy as we could be for that. So um, Michael, I interacted with all the time. Steven and Benjamin and Justin less. And, and a lot of that is because they're working on a bunch of different things and also because they don't really need to know me. We have a music director and all these people. But when they did come, their notes were so incredibly valuable. And I remember in my just my first couple of weeks, Steven just came to the theater. He was like, I don't have any notes. I don't have anything to say. I just want to see how you're doing. And, you know, so, so. Wow. They really were part of it. And Ben Cohn, who is our music director, is the original music director of the show. So he's been through every Evan, and, and that's true of John Balcourt, uh, our associate music director. And a lot of the people, you know, Michael Park and Jennifer Lore Thompson were part of the original cast. A lot of the understudies were part of the original cast. So 
I really got the the last of the legacies uh, of uh, in that regard. So it was wonderful to be part of that. And yeah, Michael, I mean, changed my life. Yeah, that's so cool. Bef before we get to Carly on this one, I'm curious. You mentioned the New York Times re-reviewed the show, right? Yes, they did. <laughs> Why did that happen? Because I know it's not often. I remember they they famously reviewed Next to Normal again when um, Marin and Jason went in. Yeah, but I don't think it really happens very often. I wonder, was it because of your amazing story of going from the Jimmys in high school to Broadway in less than a year? Kind of. It, I think it, it happens when a show relies on a singular human being. And when that human being is a different person, that means that the show is fundamentally different. So I, I, they did it when Taylor came into the show. And a lot of that was because people didn't know if the show was going to work without Ben. The show had never existed without Ben. Um, and so what they did, which is the smartest thing I think they've ever done, is they cast Taylor, who could not possibly be more different from Ben. Um, <laughs> yeah. And they reviewed the show and they said, this has not only has legs without Ben, but is opening up all these new things without Ben. Uh, um, because when Ben was in it, it was about Ben. And, and the story was Ben. And that was deserved and totally had to happen. But the show opened up to become an ensemble piece when it was Taylor. And so um, they weren't going to review it again with me. And they came, like Stacey Minich, our producer, was like, they're not going to review it again. Don't worry. We don't need to give you as much. Like Taylor had months of rehearsal. I only had a couple weeks. Um, then they, the times was basically like, he's getting too much press. It's not fair. We should be able to re-review. <laughs> and so they kept, uh, they actually kept putting it off by being like, oh, he's a kid. He's in school. You gotta wait till he's out of school. Um, so they did wait. Um, but I didn't know that was going to happen. And thank God I didn't know because I would have lost my absolute mind. It would be the worst performance I had ever given of Dear Evan Hansen. Um, but Michael was there every night. And so that night, and then I'll stop telling the story. Um, that night, um, the show the show ended and I had done the performance. And again, he'd been there every day. And so he comes back up to my dressing room and he gives me the biggest hug ever. And he just gives me this huge hug. And he's like, you did it. That was remarkable. And uh, and then he was like, I'm going away for a little while, but I want you to, because he, that was, he just needed to get us to that review. And, and we did it. It's like not crediting this to me in any way, but it was like just the perfect review of, of, of the show of just like, it's, it's only opening up further and further and further. So I'm, I'm really proud to have been part of that incredible cast in that moment in time. Yeah, that is so cool. I love that story. And it is true because the, the, a lot of the legend of the original cast was Ben. And yeah. so it's interesting to think about Dear Evan Hansen on Broadway and people still continuing to want to go see it beyond its star leaving, as opposed to something like Fiddler on the Roof, which is one of the most iconic theater pieces ever. And that it, the fact that it can still tour the country successfully for years and years and years is unbelievable. And it maybe isn't relying on a New York Times review, you know what I mean? So I'm just thinking about that, how interesting it is in terms of replacement casts, you know, the, I guess that's why we're here, you know, talking <laughs> about replacing. Um, but Carly, Dylan asked a question earlier and I forget what it was. Of course, yeah, no, I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was curious about how much interaction you had with the creative team. It's a yeah. Good so with Bart, Bart's a busy, busy man, oh, yeah. but we, we had him the first day and we had him for the dress rehearsal, but Sari Ketter, who was our associate director, who was a legend of her own, she is this sweet, sweet woman who did My Fair Lady in South Pacific, and she did the To Kill a Mockingbird that was at Madison Square Garden, and she's oh, just, wow. yeah, a legend. Um, she did some really incredible character work with the sisters that I will never forget and carry with me. I call it my top college acting class since I was a college student, still am, uh, on tour. But we just did this whole, all these exercises of character development and building. And Bart had put together a binder like this of research. And we got a list of books on the first day from Bart about what, uh, sourced his research, a book called Life is with People, which was all about the shtetl and the the community and the traditions traditions of, um, of these people and just really getting that sense of the community and the lives that they went through in each of these things and just 
getting to work with Sari and really go through and unpack each of those traditions and developing the relationship in each moment with each of the sisters was just so special and important to really creating Bjelka and oh, creating gosh. all of the sisters and really seeing how we grow and shape and develop. We also worked with Chris Evans, who was the associate choreographer from the Broadway production, uh, Hofesh's protege, if you will, um, going through that choreography. He even taught some master classes before rehearsal just to really get into the movement and the because it's a very different choreography style in this production. It's not right. the Jerome Robbins choreography. It's very much based in contemporary movement rather than, you know, Jerome Robbins. So we really had to kind of go to a different place in terms of that. We also worked with John Bell, who was the uh, resident music director in the Broadway production, as well as the lead conductor. And he came for a lot of the process. He was in my final callback. And oh, wow. Yeah, he was really great to work with, too. That's so. so special. Yeah, you you got to work with Sari and other people like that. And so for both of you, I'm wondering, and this might be a tougher question, what the single best piece of advice you received through the replacement process was? Ooh. That's a hard one, Dylan. It could be, it could be even um, who who supported you the most, um, yeah. the team or the cast. I think, I think overall, something that's really stuck with me is first of all the the best nuggets of wisdom i ever got were from lisa brescia she is the greatest one of the greatest performers of all time uh and i'm so so lucky that she's still in my life and we talk all the time but i think something about michael was he he there was no expectation for me to be ben there was no expectation for me to be taylor only the one that i had for myself <laughs> i think um with him he pushed me and pushed me and pushed me that's good uh, I don't mean that to sound bad in any way, <laughs> but he, he he really pushed me because what he is so excellent at is seeing what is special about you and what you can bring to the table. So he pushed me further in the direction of my perfect version of the show. And so there were so many moments that we would just try stuff and contradictory uh, uh, notes of like, try this and then no, 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 no. Like, totally going back on what I told you yesterday and that you did on Broadway last night. You know, it, it was it was finding what was my perfect version of this character. And, and that was something he so brilliantly guided me towards. That's wonderful. Carly, what about you? Can you think of any um, amazing advice or? Yeah, I think for me, I mean, this is my first national tour and, you know, traveling around the country can be daunting for a 20 year old when you're the youngest in the cast and you know you're in a different city every week and there's such an age range in the cast and at times I you know got a little overwhelmed as we all do and just uh realizing from the older members of the cast who really I got 60 brothers and sisters but and moms and dads and everything in between in between the creatives and the crew and the cast and everybody but just that it's okay to know yourself and to take the time for yourself to do what you need to do both on and off stage so when i first started touring i wanted to of course see everything in every city and i was so excited to you know see the world and eat food and all the things but just knowing when to take the time for myself to regroup and for my own mental health i think is so important and so overlooked i think at times and i think it's just really important to know when to take the time you need for yourself to just chill and refresh. That's amazing advice. And I think especially learning that so young, you'll be able to take that with you forever. That's awesome. Yeah, you mentioned that you're still in college now. And I know, Andrew, you're going to be embarking upon college soon. You know, I've often heard that being on a national tour is akin to receiving a college education, the way that you grow and experience things, kind of being on your own, like that whole that whole aspect. Um, okay, so we need to talk a little bit about how much freedom you get when you're replacing. If if you're you've kind of touched on this a little bit, Andrew, with you weren't expected to be Taylor or Ben or Noah, but um, there is obviously a framework for the character that you're stepping into, and I'm curious uh, how much freedom you had, and if you were told to rein it back at any points throughout your your um, rehearsal process. Yeah, I, it. I will say, I don't think freedom is the word because it wasn't like I could just go out and do whatever I wanted. 
Um, but especially in the rehearsal process, the beginning was just sitting around a table and talking about it and, and uh, doing scene work, which is my very favorite thing in the whole entire world of just like, I would talk about how I perceived something and then they would give me the space to rehearse it and figure out that I was wrong, you know? So like about, about this or that and, and uh, certain relationships in the show. Um, yeah, of course there was absolutely a framework for the choreography. And, and I think that's because it's Michael, it's all a lot more specific than I thought. And, and the lighting is so particular in the show that, you know, there's less freedom in terms of movement than I had definitely thought. Um, but there really was the freedom to figure out how to make this role my own in a guided way with the associate directors and, and with Michael. I think any pressure put on me to be Ben was put on myself by me. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, I, I absolutely felt that pressure, especially at the beginning, just because that performance meant so much to me and Taylor's performance meant so much to me. So, so there was definitely such a huge part of me that wanted to, to be as effective as them and, and, so I would do so much. I think another piece of advice I just remembered was actually from Michael Park when he was just like, you don't have to do anything. Like <laughs> you, don't, you can go out you, like I, and, and I kept getting this advice really from Justin Paul and lots of different people. I'm a, I am a teenager and I'm like, I'm, what am I doing? Going out and trying to look like a teenager and be a teenager. <laughs> I know what this is. Like, I, I know, I know innately what this is. So I think I had lots of freedom in that of, of I get to go out and be myself. And, and that's it. That's it's the role is just so close to me. So I, I yeah. went out and was myself for two and a half hours straight. <laughs> that's beautiful. Now, Carly, you are also a teenager and, and a little older well, <laughs> in the show, like, in the show, in the show. Well, actually, isn't your character supposed to be like a kid? So, yeah. So Bielka's supposed to be nine. Okay. Wow. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not. Yeah. I'm Stage pretty, magic. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm pretty small, so, you know, kind of works. But yeah, a lot of the character development for me and what we talked about with our associate director was how much of this, of everything going on, does Bielka really grasp at such a young age? You know, she's nine. And there are some big things happening with the pogrom and Hava in Act Two and, you know, everything that really goes on throughout the course. How much is she really grasping and how much of that childlike innocence is in there? So really... For me, it was finding the balance of, you know, she's a kid and she wants to, you know, be a little kid and play and have fun with Sprinza and yeah. everybody else. But at the same time, there are some big things happening to her family and to her community and to the world that she kind of has to navigate at such a young age. So it was a fun, fun experience for me to kind of build that world for her. Oh, absolutely. And didn't, doesn't um, Bielka and Sprinza spend a lot of time with Golda? They do, the yeah. We had a lot of fun. Um, some really, our uh, Golda, Maite Yuzal, was the the ad lib and scene building, like behind the scenes queen. So a lot of really, really fun uh, ad lib scenes happened for sure. That's awesome. Thanks. That is so fun. God, I love Fiddler on the Roof and I loved that Bartlett Share production, the the framing device that went into that show just made it so unique. Was that the same on tour? It was, yeah. I remember Danny Burstein unzipping the red, it was like a red puffy red jacket. Coat. Yeah, the red <laughs> coat. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that was the number one question always at the stage door after every night was, what was the red coat? What was, what was the meaning of the red coat? And we... We've talked a lot about it and there are several things, but we always like to say, well, what do you think the red coat is? And, you know, Ooh. be all mysterious. And here's some really cool interpretations of what people got from the red coat. And then like the funniest thing was always younger kids at the stage door being like, and all of a sudden that guy in the red coat was Tevya. <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> That's cute. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we've talked about you know, your, your experience replacing in these iconic shows. I've got a question. So, you know, say when Broadway comes back and you have no other commitments, what's a show you would love to replace in and what role? Uh, oh man. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. Um, so I don't know in a perfect world. Um, I would love to replace uh, Dana Steingold as the Girl Scout. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. I can see it. I can fully see it. Oh, thank you. 
definitely a dream. I hope Beetlejuice comes back. There was talk. I do too. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, it's in the works, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. A tour. Yeah. True. Um, I'd love to do Seymour. Um, I hope that off-Broadway production just kind of sticks around for a couple of years so I can get old enough. Um, but yes. I, I, I hope Jeremy gets to do it, though. You know, he was yeah. like, final rehearsal as everything went down. Oh, yeah. Did he ever even go on? Like, no. yeah, oh, my goodness. That so was the last shows. show I saw. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it was Jonathan Groff in. Wow. Yeah. So that means you saw us standing outside trying to win the lottery <laughs> literally every night in that it was such a cold winter. It was, Did you ever win? No. Not once. I'm so mad I didn't get to see that production. Little Shop of Hearts is one of my favorite shows of all time. It means so much to me. I'm so mad. I really, if Christian Borle does not go back to that show, I'm going to be so. <laughs> he stole the whole show. Oh, I have to see him in it. Ugh, he not i mean he was incredible as the dentist but all of the smaller roles all the ensemble filler roles that they had in play he did a one-man show it was just incredible i love it that's yeah well, i hope we see a lot of cool new productions and and obviously some glorious revivals as well um you know every year broadway.com does that best replacement award in a show like where the fans will vote mm -hmm. do either of you have someone who stepped into a role on broadway throughout you know you're obviously fans of theater as well who who made a big impact on you despite them maybe not being the original in a show that's a great um, question Lynn. Well, the first one that comes to mind would probably be um, Andrew Barth Feldman in Dear Evan Hansen. <laughs> um, very, very nice. Agree. Uh, I uh, would have to say I saw Bernadette Peters take over in Hello, Dolly. Oh. Uh, just, I love Bernadette. It was just incredible watching her do that role. Theater magic. Agree. Um, before I say anyone else, I have to give like every replacement in Dear Evan Hansen has been has opened up this like completely changed the show. Sky Lakota Lynch, Sammy Williams, Phoenix Best, Ivan Hernandez, Ann Sanders, Christian Noel, Jessica Phillips, I could keep going, Jared Goldsmith, Phoebe Koyabi, but like they all change the story fundamentally. And it's so refreshing. Um and also Taylor, I, I should mention because my goodness, and I wish I got to see Jordan, but I didn't. Um but what I was gonna say um someone else and now I forgot. <laughs> I also saw Bernadette, Unreal. Um, I feel like I gotta like, man, you gotta talk about Jessica Vosk. Like she's now like, I know, right? Definitive alpha mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And has Fiddler, Fiddler ties. And Sarah. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Her, the, her costume still says Jessica Vosk, the ones that we use. Wow. Little that's, artifact. Um, I feel like that's maybe my answer. What's cool too, Andrew, is you mentioned Lisa Brescia earlier. I feel like I knew her as being an alphaba replay or er, standby i think i don't even know was she full-time ever yeah she uh on tour yeah on tour okay she, i mean mama mia jesus christ superstar she her aida her lineup of credits is insane and so versatile because she doesn't she just goes and is herself like she's not like i wouldn't you would never in a million years peg her for an alphabet because she's just not that kind of singer but then you hear her yeah. singing like, oh this is what it's supposed to sound like mm -hmm. like you know she's she's incredible her heidi She's the best actor on the planet. And and doing that show with her is like the greatest honor of my life. Oh my god. We need her on this panel next year. I know. Broadway Con, this is our call there's, to action. She's literally a professor currently. And, <laughs> and so that's why I feel like I wanted to go to a conservatory um, uh, for college. And then I was like, I'm I'm at one right now. I'm learning, <laughs> I'm learning from Michael Greif. You know, it was uh, mind blowing. I am curious about another thing. So once you're in a show and and you're fully integrated into the cast and other replacements start to come in, what is that experience like of other people then being on stage and being the newbies for a change? It's Carly, did that happen on tour? It did, yeah. We yeah. actually had um, one person who left and we had one replacement and then we had one very sweet dean who uh was a replacement who was supposed to have his put in rehearsal the day that we got shut down oh, so uh -huh. he did his shadowing and everything for avram and never actually got to go on yeah. 
I will say on behalf of the rest of the cast that putting in an Evan is absolutely grueling. And oh. like, the amount of rehearsals, the amount of, cause like everyone has to completely change their performance when there's a new Evan. And for some it's easier than others. Like I know with Lisa, like with Taylor, she was a lot more, she, she, the character of Heidi had a bit more independence because you know, she could, she could be sort of distant. Whereas with me, it was like, I'm leaving now. Okay. Like, because I'm this little kid who looks like a deer in headlights. <laughs> uh, but like, I know, especially it's really Heidi and Jared that get the biggest, like Jared's performance. Like he had to bully me so much less because it really seemed like he was like bullying me <laughs> as opposed to Taylor where it was just like, oh, it's funny and, and fun. Um, but I had to, we had to put in a lot of replacements. I think I've, I've had, I think the most is I had three full-time Cynthia's, um, but, uh, wow. Yeah. And a lot of understudies too. Um, I've probably been on with like six or seven Cynthia's, but, um, I love it personally. I, I think keeping the show fresh, especially a show like Dear Evan Hansen that really needs to be organic while being as precise as possible every night. It's incredibly useful to have new energy to like get whisked away in that story with. So I, I loved it. It was hard uh, to do put-ins and stuff, especially, you know, doing words fail in a put-in and then doing it that night. They'd be like, don't cry. You don't have to cry. And I'm like, I can't, I literally can't do this song without crying. So like, I'm, I'm going to have to right now. Um, but I mean, it's magic when, when there are new wonderful people in the show and every, every replacement we've had is just like the best human being in the world. And I'm sure they felt the same way about bringing in new people, like both of you into the shows that you replaced in. That's nice. Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So we're coming to the end of the panel now and we wanted to do something kind of fun that we do at the end of our podcast. We usually end on something we call a dose of drama. And for this specific panel, we want to know from both of you in your experience replacing in these shows, was there ever any drama, AKA like on stage mishaps, fun backstage <laughs> tidbits, or never before told stories you want to share really quick before we say oh, goodbye. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Carly, um, what, what are you thinking? Well, my opening night of Fiddler, we were in Fort Worth, Texas, and my costume, it's many layers. I have my apron, I have a bunch of skirts, I have my pinafore underneath. One of my layers of skirts, right as we're running on for the top of tradition, comes off and it unbuttons and it's like just like hanging there like in the middle of my legs in the middle of the the song and tradition is you know the arms the mm -hmm. iconic tradition oh. arms so we did a half iconic tradition arms like <laughs> holding this skirt like this throughout <laughs> and by the end of the number it is fully around my ankles and right after that I have to go into the the opening scene with the kitchen and you know all the girls together so my swing is in the wing she's shadowing that night and she like throw i throw the skirt at her and like hits her and we run on and it was just insane but yeah um, <laughs> i would have been all the blood would have drained from my face out of thought oh my i finally made it and of course costume malfunction oh my god first first note opening night first song boom <laughs> Andrew, what about you? Do you have any drama to, to share? Yeah, yes. I've told this story a, a good number of times now, and I might have told it on the podcast when I came out. I don't remember. Um, I used to get really bad nosebleeds growing up um, and, uh, and for m most of my life. And uh, around, I guess, when like the summer kind of started, I would get off stage from the beginning of Good For You, which is like my one of two of my really short breaks in Act Two. That's the pee break, um, where I'm like <laughs> crying and I'm like, well, I say something really, I don't even remember, but I say something really, really mean. And then I go off stage, I pee, and then I blow my nose and I like wipe my tears. I go on stage to keep doing Good For You, my nose is bleeding. And so like, I am, I am uh, just doing it. Luckily I'm in profile, so I can kind of wipe. Lisa Brescia, I, we get to so big so small lisa brescia pulls out a tissue and like wipes her <laughs> never done that before she hands me the tissue to wipe everything from that moment on everyone in the cast had tissue uh, tissues planted in their pockets just in case i had a nosebleed it's oh, yeah. worse uh, when the summer really hit i started getting them more frequently and then we get to one night where i'm in the middle of words fail normally it's happened and good for you and i've been able to manage it by words fail we get to words fail never let them see the what i see blood hit the ground 
Anthony Rosenthal from Falsettos is in the front row. And I said, like, oh. <laughs> we get to, I wipe it. I pull out the tissue. It's all fine. I get out to the stage door and I say, um, who saw my nosebleed? And everyone raises their hands. Uh. <laughs> very, very clear. So I did call out the next day and get it cauterized. I got surgery on it. No more nosebleeds anymore. Oh, amazing. Wow. I've wow. never heard that story. Yeah, I don't think you told that on the pod, so I'm I'm grateful for that nugget. Wow. You know, you really bled for the role of Evan. Blood, sweat, and tears. Absolutely. <laughs> Wild. Well, listen, this was so much fun, and we're sadly we sadly gotta go now. But Carly and Andrew, thank you so much for joining us for this panel. It's been honestly super interesting to learn about what it's like to replace in two diff very different but equally iconic musical productions. So thank you so much for your time. So much for having us. Yeah, and thank you so much. Where can everyone so find you both? Ooh. Carly, are you on Instagram? I am, yes. At Carly Post One. The one and only. The one. Yes. Yeah, well, I'm at Andrew B. Feldman underscore on Instagram, which oh, is nice. Cool. But uh, <laughs> regular Andrew B. Feldman on Twitter. And uh, just Google search me up on uh, YouTube and stuff. Yeah. Wow. Oh my God. Well, and if you loved us, you can follow at the drama podcast on Twitter and Instagram and check out amazing interviews with tons of Broadway replacements, including Andrew Barth Feldman here today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for having Thanks. us. Bye. 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 Bye.